Greetings, uh, fellow farmers, and welcome to this week's uh, webinar on the business of farming, where we dwell in the world of farming and agribusiness. My name is Rollins, and I am honored to be your moderator for today's session, uh, a session that is being live streamed on the Agribusiness Media uh, Facebook page, a home to the nation's uh, largest online farming community. Our focus today is on maize harvesting and post harvest management. As we come together, let us remember that as farmers, we are not only farmers, but also caretakers of the earth, responsible for the cultivating of the very crops that sustain life. So join me and our distinguished panelists as we plant the seeds of knowledge and harvest the abundant wisdom in this enlightening uh, webinar. We have assembled an exceptional group of experts to guide you through every aspect of maize harvesting, that is from preparation to maximizing your profits, that is right up to selling your maize. So our esteemed panelists include Isa Jaidi from the Department of Agricultural and Rural Development Advisory, and that is a department under the Minister of Agriculture. We also have Mr. Joe Mukandla, a seasoned agronomist, from uh, Syngenta. We do have uh, Chiedza Sangweme from the Zimbabwe Mercantile Exchange. So don't miss this great opportunity to learn from these uh, experts. And I understand some have been uh, facing a challenge with our link. We have updated and uh, we are resending the link to join this uh, meeting. And um, uh, thanks to those that are watching live uh, on our Agribusiness Media Facebook uh, page. And how the webinar is going to unfold is we will have uh, presentations from our esteemed uh, panelists. Then right after the presentations, I uh, will factor in uh, the questions that you have. So we do have a question and answer session. Do submit your questions uh, using the chat room feature once we enable it here on Zoom, or you can comment if you are watching us live on the Agribusiness Media Facebook page. So the experts are here to help you to capitalize on all the hard work the early mornings, the sleepless nights that you have endured. So without further delay, let's begin with our first presentation by Jayidi from the Department of Agricultural and Rural Development Advisory Services, which falls under the Ministry of Agriculture. He will share his expertise on uh, when to harvest, harvesting methods, as well as moisture requirements, and he will also touch on uh, drying. Uh, please hold on for his uh, presentation. Please call for it. Hello, farmers. We are during that time of the year where harvesting of maize is in progress. We need to understand when the farmers should harvest their maize. There are indicator points that allows us to know when we should harvest. The first indicator point is that maize should have reached the physiological maturity. Despite reaching the physiological maturity, which can be reached when the maize is even up to 30% dry. But the 80% dry maize cannot be shelled well when it is harvested. So another key indicator is to say your maize should have dried to a moisture level that allows it to shell well from the cob. We are looking at the region of 18% thereabout. But how do you harvest the maize? When you harvest the maize, there are two, three ways of doing it. One way you can do it manually. Manually we are using hands, people to just go into the field, harvest the, the, the maize and maybe take it to a crib or to a storage place. One, another way of doing it, you could be using the, 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 the mixture of human beings and machines. You can harvest your maize using your hands or labor, and the labor takes the maize to the, to the shell where it is shelled. Or you can preferably use a combine harvester that does both the, the gathering of the, the maize and the shelling, and the maize comes out as, a, as a grain from the combine harvester. The beauty of using your combine harvester is the pace of doing things is a bit faster. You combine the events in, 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 one, in one pass. But what you have to remember when you're using your combine harvester, there are fins there that have got to be adjusted very well because the fins, they blow the chaffer after the maize would have been shelled. And if the fin is not adjusted well, you run the risk of throwing the grain together with the chaff that goes out of the, the combine harvester. But mind you, this time of the year when we are harvesting, we are saying we are harvesting when the moisture is still high because we want to allow the field to accommodate other crops, particularly wheat. 
we then have to make sure we dry this maize. As we go to storage, we want to store maize that is about 12 and a half percent to store a bit longer. But the maize we have is more that is more than 18 and a half. We are looking in the region of maybe 16 to 20 percent this time of the year when we are harvesting. So we need to dry the maize. The maize can preferably be dried in a crib. If you are going to be using a crib, make sure moisture is going to be able to pass through the crib from either side of the crib to go to pass through the, the crib. Preferably orient your crib in a direction of west to east to allow air to dry through the, the crib. Then the other way of drying it, you want to make sure you take this maize to a maize dryer where you are going to you'll be using artificial means of driving hot air into the maize and the advantage of using the dryers the current ones that are stationed at gmbs and other people who are offering the services is that when you are drying the maize the maize will be mechanically moved and there is no possibility that some other portions of the maize will not be reached with the right air temperature to make sure it, it dries if you store in a crib if the crib is too big you run the risk of having mold maize in the in, in the in, in the crib we are looking at post harvest. Normally, farmers are used to say harvesting of maize ends at, at grain delivery. Harvest of maize doesn't end, end at grain delivery. We are also looking at the stover that is in the in the field. The maize stover can also be looked after to make sure it doesn't waste after having harvested the maize. We can bail the maize stover. After bailing the maize stover, it should be stored in a cool, dry place where there are no leaks. The leaks will make sure the stove dries or gets burnt before it is used by our, our livestock. Then in terms of storage of the, the maize, there are various other means of storing the maize. We want to make sure you protect that maize from other rodents and the pilferage that is theft. And when you are storing the maize, you can also use the other methods that are going to be stocked up like the hermetic bag storing the maize out of the in the absence of oxygen you want to make sure the maize is stored in places where oxygen is excluded that's the hermetic condition this is it farmers when you are talking about post harvest in terms of maize thank you farmers all right uh, thank you very much we appreciate uh, this uh, informative and insightful presentation if you do have any questions for him, please do submit uh, via the chat or you can use the comment uh, section if you are watching us live on our Agribusiness Media Facebook page. Next, we do have Mr. Joe Mukandla from Syngenta. He is a seasoned agronomist with a vast of experience in uh, the uh, uh, in uh, agriculture. So he will share with us his knowledge and resources for May storage. We eagerly wait your insights, Mr. Joe Mukandla. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone, farmers and various experts and the organizers of this very important uh, topic, uh, which uh, in Syngenta we call the post-harvest grain pest management, but there are other uh, post-harvest uh, management uh, issues which may involve horticulture, you know, your, your oranges, your strawberries, etc. They also have got a post-harvest a management requirement, but this one is specific to the various grains which um, farmers must be busy uh, harvesting. This picture I took this morning from uh, one of my fields. Uh, most of the crops should be uh, at this stage. Uh, this was a November planted maize crop. You can see it's still standing, no lodging, no weeds, etc. So expecting a good harvest. And then after harvesting, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we protect this grain uh, moving forward. Was uh, not knowing what the weather conditions are going to be in 23, going into 24. It could be a drought year, it could be a flood year. So everything that is harvested is quite, uh, quite precious. And uh, as we know, during the months of April, May, June, maybe the, some late ones, they go into July, uh, harvesting the various crops, uh, which is not only maize, but um, those sugar beans, the uh, the African pea, which is called nyemba, 
Yonimos, uh, the small grains, etc. Recently, I had a farmer calling in from Bybridge, uh, wanting to uh, treat their their munga. And when I asked how much have you got, and they said I've got uh, more than a ton, which is which is quite quite good for an area like uh, Bybridge. It's a it's a dry area, so. Anything which is harvested is quite valuable and is uh, is part of the uh, that food security, uh, which could be at uh, at the home level, community level, even at the uh, national level, even uh, globally. If uh, globally there is food security, it means countries which are, have got a deficit can import from those with a surplus. Can you imagine all countries having a deficit and not sharing? Food, we might end up fighting uh, for that food. Now, the thing is that uh, when you have this grain and you put it all in one place, uh, remember uh, out in the field, it's spread over so many hectares, but you have a seed, you're bringing it into uh, probably an area which is not bigger than a hundred square meters. So you're uh, concentrating a lot of uh, food there, which is food for insects. Remember, the insects are always out there uh, looking for easy ways of uh, getting into whatever they, uh, they prefer to eat. Uh, so once you gather the grains, put them in one place, you're making those grains very prone to uh, attention, identification by the insects. Because the insects, they, they're always flying around looking, uh, looking for food and uh, migrating. So it's very important that uh, we consider that as an important fact that uh, by uh, harvesting, we are actually attracting uh, these insects. They find it easy to find uh, their food. And there are various reasons why uh, uh, we might be wanting to uh, look after the stored grain, which could be used for uh, home consumption by the small scale farmers. It could be by the, the urban people, we, those people living in towns, uh, they can't grow anything. So they buy grain from outside. They don't want to buy a super refined milli meal. They want the, the whole meal. So they buy grain, they, they want to grind it, but uh, they need to be like educated in terms of how do they look after that, that grain so that it preserves the, uh, the quality that it, uh, it came with. It could be a grain which is uh, grown on farms for on-farm uh, food security for, for farm workers. Uh, I know that uh, there's a shortage of uh, farm workers these days on tobacco farms, uh, horticulture farms, and, and these uh, uh, workers, they'll go where they know there's, there's food security. So some of the farmers, they, they grow maize and other grains specific to store on the farm and uh, to provide that as a lure for uh, farm workers who are looking, looking for work. It could be a, a grain storage by traders who want to uh, buy grain now and then they keep it and want to sell it when prices are much higher. Normally around December, December to April, uh, the prices of grains are very, very high attractive. And also it could be uh, in the form of on-farm grown seed. Uh, we should not forget that seed can also be grown on the farm and uh, also needs to be uh, taken care of in terms of uh, uh, this uh, uh, preservation from the insect pests, uh, which could damage uh, uh, that seed. But it's not only the insects which uh, can damage uh, uh, grain. We know the rats, they also get attracted. Birds, they also get in termites. If, if, the, if the grain is just uh, spread on the ground, I've seen on one or two farms, grain just, uh, no cobs of grain, of maize on, uh, just lying on the soil and termites uh, quickly come in and devour that. And there's also disease, the moles. If the grain is not properly dried, uh, we did hear from the pre uh, previous speaker talking about moisture content. That's very important in terms of uh, keeping out those molds. If you're going to be storing your grain in like bulk, in steel tanks, in concrete tanks, in some kind of silo, uh, ventilation can be a problem there. 
and uh, molds uh, quickly uh, develop. So that's that's another way of uh, that's another watch out in terms of uh, post harvest uh, grain storage. Uh, but the major one is the uh, the insect pests, uh, which uh, I'll discuss in more detail. Now in Zimbabwe, we've got quite a number of uh, chemicals which are registered uh, for use as grain storage. And here I've listed uh, seven. This is from a list uh, that uh, a trial that Syngenta has been doing, uh, just uh, comparing the various uh, grain protectants which are available on the market. You can see there, it says eight there, but uh, number one is untreated. So we normally want to compare uh, if you leave grain un untreated and uh, what happens when you put various different types of uh, grain protectants. So there is a list of uh, seven, actually gold dust, Murinda Go, uh, Vision, Shumba Plus, uh, Chikwapuro, Chamboko, uh, and Agricura grain dust. And then you, you get your active ingredients there, which uh, are shown in the next column and, and also the uh, content. This is, this is quite important to know what uh, active ingredient is in that uh, grain protectant and as well the strength and uh, the, the strength uh, of these grain protectants is very dilute. Um, it's something like 2%, the total active ingredient in a grain protectant should be around uh, 2%, which means the other 98% is, is carrying that 2%. Because you're going to mix uh, these chemicals with um, with food, with grain, with uh, whatever. So you don't want to be loading a lot of active ingredient because eventually that grain is going to be consumed by people, by animals, by chickens, etc. So we tend to formulate these in the form of a dust, of a very dilute dust, 2%. If you take a typical uh, chemical which is used for spraying, uh, it could be uh, anything between 25 and 90 percent. So the uh, concentration, that's, that's one very important uh, factor. Uh, I've been asked to um, uh, talk about factors uh, farmers or users uh, should look for when buying grain protectants. So I've just mentioned one of them, uh, that concentration must be a dilute, must be like a 2 percent, roughly 2 percent. Uh, is a, is an FAO uh, standard. Uh, we go along with the FAO standards because this is uh, international. These uh, products are used not only in Zimbabwe, but the whole of Africa, uh, Asia, and, and uh, other countries. So uh, just a few tips on factors to watch out for. Number one is uh, uh, safety to the user when they're going to be applying that product. We know fumigants, uh, they, there's a lot of lots of talks about uh, fumit uh, fumigants, your gas toxin, phostoxin, et cetera, et cetera. These are very good for uh, cleaning uh, bulk uh, grain in a silo, in, in those things when you think uh, they are probably even rats and things like that. So you, you chuck in these, uh, these tablets, but uh, remember they are very toxic. Highly toxic. They really, really, they should be used by um, under supervision or by qualified uh, applicators. So it's a purple triangle type of product, highly effective, but also highly toxic to to the user. So I would not encourage a lot of usage of these uh, uh, fumigants. Then the other one, which I listed in the earlier slides, are the dusts, uh, which act as contacts, they are not fumigant, they are mainly contact. And all of them are of the green triangle. In Zimbabwe, we use the green triangle to indicate the, the level of toxicity of a product to the users, not to the pests or diseases or what, but the green triangle refers to safety to the user, or I would rather say a level of uh, toxicity because there is no single chemical that we can say is safe. Uh, we don't associate chemicals with safety. They've got some level of toxicity. So you've got the uh, harmless ones, you've got slightly harmful, and then you've got the uh, very 
toxic ones. And these are classified in the form of these triangles, which are easy to identify. Green triangle is the least toxic, followed by your orange type of triangle, followed by the red triangle, and the most toxic being the uh, purple triangles. So uh, when buying, just check that there's a triangle there on the container and uh, it's a green one. However, having said these are relatively harmless, I've observed that some users, they tend to have some allergies when they are hand handling this uh, uh, dust. You know, it's dust, you're going to breathe it. And when you uh, breathe, then you start sneezing. When you, when you sneeze, that's, that's an indication that uh, that product, you are probably uh, allergic to it. And allergies are different from person to person. When I'm using these grain protectants, I, I don't seem to, uh, to sneeze at all. So I'm one of those who are uh, free from uh, this allergic uh, weakness. But watch out uh, when you've got a number of uh, workers uh, uh, mixing the grain. If you see one of them uh, sneezing or a few of them sneezing, you need to keep them away from doing that particular job. It means they are allergic. And then there's the safety after application. Uh, here I'm talking about the time that one needs to wait after treating the grain and before consuming it or before cooking it or before giving it out to your livestock, chickens and whatever. And normally the range is between seven and uh, 30 days. So watch out uh, for, uh, for that one. Uh, check on the safety period, which is usually stated on the label of that uh, container. However, a problem normally arises when there is an agent need to use that grain. There might be a funeral, there might be whatever, whatever happens and you treated the, your grain uh, seven days ago or a day before, uh, don't use that grain. If those number of days have not yet passed, you rather go and uh, buy uh, grain which is untreated or buy millimeter. The other factor to consider is uh, the expected length of control. When you treat your grain, how long will the insects not be able to infest or to damage that grain? And normally the ranges are between a month and 12 months. The fumigants, uh, which I talked about, your castoxins, whatever, whatever, uh, once you open that pile of of grain, uh, the residual effects of the fumigant uh, disappears. So normally fumigants, we expect that uh, every month uh, or every two months, you need to come back and re-fumigate. But the dust uh, which act as contacts, they normally give quite a good length of control, but it could vary between three and 12 months. So you need to uh, check the particular products that uh, you are buying, what the manufacturer claims as the length of control, because this is very key. Uh, you don't want to be retreating uh, after every three months or six months. You want to treat and you get your 12 months control until the next uh, harvest. Another important factor is the range of pests, which are controlled mainly here. We're looking at the maize weevil, uh, at the larger grain borer and as well as the moths. The weevils have been around uh, forever, but the larger grain borer started coming into the country. It was introduced uh, with imported grains around about uh, 1990, 91, 92, uh, when uh, we had the, uh, one of the most serious droughts and uh, uh, grain had to be um, uh, imported from, I think from Central America. It, it came through one of the ports in East Africa, then by train uh, down to Zimbabwe and came with it this larger grain border, which is now a very worrisome a pest in this country. Now, in terms of toxicity, I did talk about this green triangle, uh, purple triangle. Uh, each product needs to have a declaration at the time of uh, registration. What, 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 what type of toxicity level does it possess? And this is just one example of the uh, actelic gold dust, which is uh, manufactured by Syngenta. So they, 
There is this LD50 oral numbers, uh, thermal numbers, and, and, and these thousands uh, indicate that the uh, product is fairly uh, uh, harmless. You can see on the eye irritation there, you also need to declare, is it likely to irritate your eyes? Is it likely to ir irritate your skin? So there are lots of things which uh, go into the uh, harmful or toxicity uh, of a product. I don't like using safe uh, because nothing is really safe. Now going to safety, uh, uh, safety features when using the, applying these grain protectants, uh, generally there are three ways or three routes by which uh, a chemical can go into a human body. And the first one is through inhalation, which means breathing. When you're handling that product, the dust which is there, you could be breathing that dust. And some people react, like I said, uh, by sneezing. That's an indication that you are not handling that product uh, safely. You are, you are allergic to that product. So one way of uh, managing this is to wear the mask. People have associated masks with COVID. I don't associate masks with COVID. I wear it most of the time when driving, following cars on dusty roads, put on your mask because you're preventing that dust from, dust from uh, uh, coming into your lungs. Same thing when you're uh, handling these uh, rain protectant dust, put on a mask as a, as a form of routine so that if there's any, any form of dust which you might breathe, that is going to be stopped. Respirator, uh, respirators for uh, dust products are not necessary. They are necessary for those highly toxic uh, fumigant type of uh, chemicals. Second route is uh, via the skin, contact uh, with the skin. Uh, and this we can, we can uh, avoid by wearing gloves. It could be a, a simple plastic, uh, plastic glove. Uh, and uh, as well, try and use long sleeved shirts. And if you're a lady, long sleeved tops, uh, you can also use them. Um, uh, the work suits, uh, overalls, is just to minimize the amount of skin surface which is exposed uh, uh, to these chemicals. Even if they are dilute, even if they are green triangle, always uh, take care, uh, avoid uh, unnecessary exposure. And as well, avoid sweating because, uh, you know, when, when you sweat and there's dust around, it's going to easily stick uh, onto your sweat and your sweat is coming out of your skin pores, which means that sweat plus the chemical can, can now easily uh, penetrate into, into your skin via, via the pores. Also avoid uh, handling these uh, grain protectant dust when it's windy. So if you are treating your grain, uh, avoid doing it out in the open. If there's wind, do it uh, in a, a position which is sheltered. Then the third method uh, of uh, getting into the body is through swallowing, through eating, uh, either eating the uh, chemical itself or eating food which has got chemical uh, that is not yet reached that seven day or 30 day waiting period. Very important is to observe uh, those waiting periods and as well to store the chemicals under lock or out of reach of people who are not using that product, especially the children. Keep it high up so that they, they are not uh, exposed. They don't have access uh, to these chemicals. Then after use, general hygiene, you need to wash your hands. You need to wash your face before you do anything, before you smoke, before you eat, wash those hands and uh, wash the face. Very important as well is the is to change the clothes that you wear when you're handling these chemicals. And I would use specific working clothes for chemicals, whether it's to mix with grain or it's for spraying. Don't use your normal uh, your normal day-to-day uh, -day clothes. Have clothes which are specific uh, for, for this uh, purpose. So those are uh, some of the very important uh, uh, safety features. I've, I've, I've shown you the names of various names of uh, 
products that uh, you can go out and look for. Uh, just check how long they control the insects, how, how harmless or toxic they are, uh, and as well that waiting period uh, after treatment until you can consume the grain. Now I'll just quickly go through uh, the various insects uh, uh, because these are quite major. And we've got three groups uh, of insects there, the, the beetles, uh, the moths, and the mites. The mites, we don't even see them. They are there in the grain. We know that uh, they are various uh, uh, tiny mites which cause this, uh, this damage. Moths are very easy to observe. They'll be flying around. They are whitish, they are small. Uh, and then the rest, they all belong to the family of beetles and beetles. You have the adults, which could be damaging that grain, especially uh, your larger grain borer. It bores, it's a borer, it bores into the grain. But your, your maize weevil normally doesn't eat much of the grain. It, it lays the eggs and then the, 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 lab, the eggs hatch into these little uh, caterpillars larvae. And they are the ones which are sitting inside the grain and consuming that uh, inside of, of the grain. And we've got various uh, types of, of these insects. And here I've, I've shown you the uh, technical names as, as well as the common names, the grain weevil, very common. Uh, the larger grain borer, I said it came during the 1990s, is now an endemic uh, type of pest, very uh, destructive. Uh, your red flower beetle, we, this one we even see when we keep biscuits, uh, in our homes, you see those little uh, reddish uh, beetles, that's the red flower beetle. Then your grain moth, Indian moths, are the, are the ones which uh, uh, fly around. And then for the, for the beans, your sugar beans and, and cow peas, you get a specific type of beetle. It's not the grain weevil, it's not the larger grain borer, it's not the, 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 the first three, the first four or five, they attack cereal grains, your maize, sorghum, Munga, etc. But those last two, they they attack legumes, which is your beans, sugar beans, and cow peas, and they just love uh, going into those into those crops. And these are the various uh, photos of these uh, uh, of these uh, insects. The weevil uh, and the larger grain borer are very very key. Um, I, I've got, I've done 24 minutes. Uh, I, I think I can, I don't know if you want me to share these slides. There's no point going through these slides. It's straightforward uh, information, which you can uh, read on your own. Uh, so uh, organizer, I don't know what uh, you want to do. We can save time by not, uh, by not going through slide by slide. I can send them to you. And you yes, can, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, can use it. Yeah, one thing which I would like to emphasize yeah, 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 just briefly before I, I stop is that uh, you need to properly dry. I think the first speaker did talk about moisture content drying and those things. It's very important to dry to that tip, uh, to a certain level. Uh, and then for maize, avoid storing maize on the cob. Uh, shell it as soon as possible because the larger grain borer is known to be attracted to maize on the cob. It prefers, because it goes straight into that cob. It's a, it's a tree borer uh, by nature. It, it feeds out there in the bush, uh, boring trees and what. But once uh, maize is harvested, maize is a softer thing than, uh, than the trees. So it, it soon quickly identifies a pile of maize on the cob, because the cob is also a hardish type of thing. So they then they quickly attract it. So by shelling as, as soon as possible, you are also minimizing the chances of the larger grain borer detecting uh, your, your harvest. That's the other thing which I just wanted to emphasize. Let me see if they are, yeah, these, yeah you see uh, with the, uh, one example, they are telecall dust, which is made by Syngenta. There we show it's a contact residual stomach fumigant type activity with a, a protection period of up to 12 months, but can be consumed uh, within a week after application. It's, it's some of those uh, factors which I did mention when you are going out to buy 
uh, these various uh, fumigants. Also, you need to know the rate of application. Most of them are used at uh, normally it's the same rate, 500 grams per ton uh, of, um, of grain, but then you need to narrow it down to how much per uh, 150 kg bag or per, uh, per 100 kgs of bag. It's, it's very important to use uh, the correct rate because if you underdose, you're not going to get the full length of control and you might be creating problems that insects will sooner or later become resistant to that uh, particular grain protectant. We know a um, larger grain borer has become resistant to the pyrethroid type of uh, insecticide. So this is why new active ingredients have to be brought in and registered uh, for that uh, larger grain borer. And this is a quick slide just showing uh, how you should do it when mixing. You can see they're wearing gloves, long sleeves, uh, even the shoes, uh, it's got shoes there, and the grain is on a nice clean uh, type of sheet, and uh, then he does uh, his mixing. Right, I think I'll stop here, uh, it's 27 minutes, uh, it's 28 minutes, uh, I, I hand back to the organizer. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mukandla, for your valuable input. And that was a great presentation uh, and an informative uh, presentation. Thank you very much. So uh, farmers, for all your grain protection needs, Sinjeta has got you covered. Uh, as we transition to the next uh, presentation, we do recognize that after a season of hard work, it is time to reap the rewards. It is time to reinvest and it is time to prefer or to prepare for the next season. And this requires a reliable market. And to enlighten us on this subject, we are pleased to welcome Chi Edza from the Zimbabwe Mercantile Exchange. And she will unveil the secrets to efficient marketing and the selling of maize. Uh, Chi Edza, you can uh, please go for it. Okay, good uh, morning, everyone. Can someone confirm if you can hear me well? Sure. Uh, that's fine. Thank you, everyone. So uh, thank you for the introductions. Uh, like has been indicated, I am Chieza Sangwemi. I am with uh, Zedemix as uh, the business development manager. And today we will be talking about uh, the marketing, uh, the maize marketing opportunities uh, during this 2023 agricultural season. So just as a way of uh, introduction, uh, we understand the challenges that the agricultural sector in terms of uh, marketing faces, trades and markets. And we understand that uh, it's highly characterized by inefficient logistics infrastructure, uh, some limitations in terms of price discovery. Uh, most farmers are usually price takers. There are also issues to do with uh, illiquidity. The buyers who want to purchase the commodities probably do not have these funds on hand, or they would prefer to pay at a later date. And with the hyperinflationary environment that is characterized in the country, we find that this is also causing some challenges. There are also some issues that, you, that, that have to do with uh, the limited price risk management tools, uh, especially for, for producers. Uh, as a result, uh, we have what the Zimbabwe Mercantile Exchange actually coming to provide an alternative source uh, of marketing uh, efficiencies. So just as a background about what ZMX is, uh, we are a public-private partnership uh, and our shareholders uh, include um, FinSec, uh, which is the leading uh, uh, shareholder in terms of uh, the provision of the technology that ZMX works with. Mm -hmm. and then we've got TSL Limited, uh, we've got um, CBZ, uh, it's been also we've got the government of Zimbabwe being represented by, um, mm -hmm. by the Green Marketing Board. So, as ZMX, uh, we, we depend on a diverse group of participants, uh, in each of whom play a, a very important role in maintaining a fully functional marketplace. And our role is to ensure that uh, we have got fair rules uh, for all the participants that include the producers, the industrial end users, as well as, um, as the traders. We are actually uh, comfortable with uh, noting that we have got a high level of transparency and efficiency, as well as uh, standardization in terms of um, uh, the market prices, our market participants are able to compare prices on an equal basis, as well as um, our intervention in terms of liquidity, improved liquidity, and minimizing the volatility of commodities. 
also eliminating unnecessary price things. So this is round about um, what the next does. Um, we also understand the challenges that the, 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 the Zimbabwean citizens or the farmers actually face in terms of marketing of their commodities. Uh, we've been talking about the post harvest losses that are caused by limited storage options for agricultural produce. We've been talking about information asymmetry and yes, there's lack of information on fair commodity prices. Uh, for example, one farmer doesn't know how much their produce is going to cost when they is going to, to get them when they get to the to the marketplaces. And so the dynamics is also coming up to, to bridge this gain. There are some instances also where payments are delayed, uh, when the farmers get uh, delayed payments when they sell their produce, as well as uh, the issues to do with the logistical challenges. Uh, so as a result of these logistical challenges, we find out that farmers produce becomes a bit unattractive uh, because of the costs that are associated with the transportation uh, and segregation of the commodities uh, from the farmers to the buyers. So the background of, uh, of, of our discussion today, uh, let's talk about how marketing is actually been done in the past years. We understand that government has been the leading uh, part, the leading uh, organization uh, in the recent past uh, in terms of marketing, especially of strategic grains. The way statutory instruments that restricted the movement and sale of strategic grains, and just recently, uh, those who have been following up in things, we have realized that um, uh, the government has actually put a statutory instrument, uh, SI 56 of 2023, that is also recognized as remix is an alternative source market source for the trading of uh, especially maize. So we're going to be restricting our discussions to to maize for now. Uh, we have it in good hands that uh, of the, the the trading and the movement of uh, other strategic commodities like our soya beans, our wheat, our barley are also being looked at. Uh, but for purposes so of today's discussions, we we'll restrict uh, our marketing to to maize. And these uh, statutory instruments have been identifying um, GMB as the sole buyer and the sole seller of, of these grains. And as a result, there was limited alternative markets for, for, for the strategic grains. Government has also been suffering in terms of enduring the pressure to buy all of the commodities and leading to delayed payments. And we also understand that contractors were also exposed to high risk of side marketing to non-contracted buyers. And these buyers would usually just come with very low prices uh, that are meant to attract the farmers from, from their contracts. But as a result, those contractors were also going to lose out in terms of uh, the funds that they're supposed to be receiving, as well as the farmers themselves, because they'll be getting a uh, very low uh, prices. Now, in terms of the marketing arrangements for this season, our government has actually indicated that um, in 2023, GMB will only be purchasing strategic commodities from farmers that are financed under the PIP program, as well as some self finance the farmers should be able to deliver and sell their commodities to GMB. Uh, GMB government has also uh, stated that uh, all contractors are obliged to buy back uh, their contracted crops at market prices, and that self financed farmers can also sell to the best advantage on the market. And this is where the dynamics is coming, is coming from. We are also going to be providing the best um, advantage on the market to ensure that farmers have got alternatives, whether they want to sell to GMB or they want to sell through the exchange. At their commercial warehouse receives services that will be offered uh, under registered warehouses that are registered under ZMX. Uh, just at this point, I would indicate that there are some GMB warehouses that are also registered under CETEMIX, as well as some other private storage facilities that are also registered under CETEMIX. So commercial warehouse receipts will be issued for, for, for projects that will be moving through that channel. But just a glitch on, uh, on, uh, on, on the challenge that we're being faced uh, so that we get this into, into context. Uh, so the government actually, like I indicated, intends to be buying commodities from, uh, from uh, farmers that are financed under PIP. And this actually will be a non starter for Zeremex. Those who are funded under PIP will not be allowed to be trading through Zeremex. They are mandated to be delivering their produce to GMB. And... Uh, there is also need to be balancing the viable producer price and the consumer price protection that could impact if our offtake of price is at or above the premised producer, producer price. And so for food security and economic stability, the government has to ensure that farmers also receive price, viable prices and are able to finance the next crop uh, without hassles. So uh, Zenemix is also coming to ensure that farmers are getting viable prices in the, as we are moving straight into our next winter production season, farmers will be able to, to, to to support or to, to prepare for the next season. Uh, there's also mention of the private contractors uh, that may deliver their produce to GMB and then the, pay the payments for the produce uh, delivered may take time, uh, considering that they will also be paid after PIP and other self-finance produce are fully paid for.
So Zenemix is also offering a, a, another alternative source for private contractors to, to sell their produce through, the, through our system. Uh, this will ensure that the contractors are not exposed to high risk of site marketing uh, because farmers that are allowed to sell freely, farmers will be allowed uh, to sell freely on, on the market. So if contractors are also going to be making use of our platform uh, to sell their products, it means that they will be able to recoup the funds that they actually contracted uh, before the farmers receive their own payments. So it's going to be reducing the hassles that are, that are associated with them. Um, with the contractors getting the money that they, they need to get from, from the farmers. We also have other agro processors, the buyers that necessarily do not have to have contracted produce. And uh, these actually are interested in having a smooth production cycle throughout the year. And they're also uh, actually looking for, for securing cheaper prices. And they need to ring fence the year round commodity requirements at once during the harvesting season. Uh, so by this, we are saying that um, Production, our, our agricultural production is just highly cyclical. It's once a year, uh, but uh, someone who is agro, who's an agro processor would need to ring fence their, their commodity requirements so that they, are, they remain in business throughout the whole year. But then they might not have the liquidity that they have to procure all year round inventory uh, just after harvesting. And then we find out that some, some farmers do not really want to wait as well to get their, to, to move their products later on during the year. There is a gap then uh, in terms of um, of access to finance. Uh, so Zeremix is also coming up with uh, some modalities to ensure that um, there are some funds that can actually be tapped into by the agro processors uh, who are willing to buy commodities at, um, uh, at the platform. So this is the solution uh, that we are we are bringing to to into the onto the table. We are offering a centralized warehouse receipt system. So trading on the exchange will be premised on uh, on the warehouse receipt system. What this means is that uh, a producer or a farmer or a grower will have to first of all deposit their commodities into a registered warehouse and be issued with a warehouse receipt. After that, then they will be able to start to sell uh, their commodities. Now, uh, the, co the warehouse receipt that they will have received after they deposit their commodities into our warehouses can actually also be used by the farmers or the growers themselves to be able to access loans from commercial banks. Uh, if they do not want to sell their produce immediately, uh, they want to withhold their produce until the prices have improved. We all understand that prices are a little bit lower uh, just after harvest, and as you move into the lean season, prices might actually uh, go up. Uh, instead of farmers having to 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 scratch their to scratch their minds in terms of um, the collateral that the banks usually require for them to access loans, uh, they are actually all, all going to be able to make use of the warehouse receipt that they have received uh, to tap into 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 the into uh, into accessing finance. Uh, so the exchange is also designed to, to, to address limited financing options for farmers and agro processors, like I've indicated just now. And also, we're also offering solutions to transport and logistics challenges, as well as post harvest um, uh, management. We have got uh, a network of transporters that are on standby. Uh, if farmers want to deliver their produce to the registered warehouses and do not have um, transport facilities, they can also make use of uh, the transport facilities that will be uh, that will be offered by ZMX. Now, there are also solutions even for the contractors themselves. They can also utilize the warehouse well receipt system to seek for market funding through the warehouse well receipt uh, based facilities. So the warehouse well well receipts can actually be issued in favor of the farmer themselves, and they can also be issued in favor of contractors, and then they will be able to access funding from the banks using the warehouse well receipt itself. As Remix will actually also register lien charges uh, on the warehouse receipts in favor of the financiers, and then the contractor or farmers can then wait and sell the produce when the prices are favorable, and eventually the sale will be undertaken on the Zeremix uh, platform, and then the proceeds will be used to settle the obligations, and if there are some um, funds remaining, uh, which usually will be the case, this can then be forwarded either to the contractors or, or to the farmers themselves. Uh, now I'll briefly, uh, you can you can stop me if I'm going uh, beyond the 20 minutes uh, that has been indicated, but I hope I'll be on time. Now with regards to the warehouse receipts uh, mechanics, just as a, as a snapshot, uh, Zeramex is providing a mo model that will ensure that uh, the needs of the farmers and the buyers and the financiers are all met uh, in a seamless operation that will be anchored on the use of real-time technology. 
So for the contractors or the lenders, they will have to, to, to forward their loan book uh, to the Remix. Uh, this is like providing the details of all the farmers that have got outstanding loans, and then we'll be able to facilitate loan repayments uh, by doing a special pre-registration of those farmers, as well as that stock orders to guarantee that the outstanding loan are, pay, are paid and deductions are done ahead of paying the net proceeds to the farmer. So everyone who intends to be participating on the exchange will actually have to be registered. Uh, the registration of buyers is done and it's a very easy way of registering. I think I'll speak to that during my last slide. Uh, so everyone who's, who is wishing to, to trade or to use like the ZMX platform will have to be re uh, registered on our platform. Uh, then we can book for commodities and then we'll be issuing the warehouse receipt. I think I've spoken to, to this earlier. Now, uh, just uh, for you to understand the key features of the warehouse receipts, uh, just to understand what this warehouse receipt is and how it will be, it will be, it will be made use of. And the first thing is that the warehouse receipts have been recognized as a security according to the Securities Act. Uh, this means that uh, the warehouse receipts are negotiable, they are also tradable, and they can actually be used as collateral to access funds from the banks. Now, the physical warehouse receipt that you actually get to have your name and your address uh, of the person who has deposited their commodities on the exchange, that physical warehouse receipt will also have the type of the commodities indicating, is it against maize, is it barley, is it wheat, is it uh, sorghum, so whatever commodity uh, that would be are deposited, it will also be indicated on that warehouse receipt. The grade of that commodity will also be indicated. The weight or the measure of the commodity, is it 10 tons, uh, is it 20 tons? Uh, there will also be an estimated market value as a date of deposit. This will also be used when you want to uh, access uh, funds from the bank. How what, what, what is the value of the commodity that you have deposited in our warehouses? Then we have the name and address of the warehouse. Uh, is it in Mutari, is it in Harare, and who is the warehouse operator, and also who is the warehouse person who is actually uh, issued that receipt. Uh, and also the grade or the quality inspector, we've done um, the inspections. This is a, a snapshot of what we have done uh, to date. We've managed to register 26 warehouses, and like I indicated uh, before, uh, some 12 of those uh, warehouses are actually under GMB and some of them are also uh, being uh, run by private sector. We have also managed to onboard seven financial institutions that will be on standby for the warehouse receipt financing, as well as uh, for the settlement and custodian services. We've managed to register some 12 missions. We'll also be making use of, um, of the platforms for the trading. We have uh, so far listed uh, 12 commodities out of the 49 uh, commodities that are eligible for trading on the exchange. We have got uh, the statutory instruments that guide the operations and ZMX, and we've got a number of commodities that are actually allowed by law to be uh, traded on ZMX. So out of the 49 currently, we've got 12 uh, commodities, and in the remaining ones, uh, the difference between uh, 12 and 49 speaks to livestock as well as horticulture. We are not yet uh, trading horticulture and livestock, even though we are still working um, working all year round or around the, the clock, just to ensure that we've got frameworks for, for the trading of horticulture, given them the delicacies that uh, horticulture require in terms of uh, coaching facilities, as well as some other differences in terms of the trading of um, of um, for livestock. Uh, so far, we have issued 262,000 uh, tons worth of warehouse receipts, uh, especially like in maize. This is how uh, farmers or any participant is able to access our platform. We can use any form, even our smart campus, the phone is you can able, you are able to, to access our platform uh, by dialing star 727 hash across all networks, we'll be able to access our platform. A participant can also access our platform using a mobile app that is downloadable on the Apple App Store or the Apple Store. Or you can alternatively use the web portal if you have access to internet and follow the instructions to be able to register on the platforms. I'll quickly uh, rush through the opportunities uh, for marketing through ZMX. Why we think that uh, you will benefit if you market your produce through our exchange. Uh, we spoke about coordinated logistics to move commodities from the farms to the designated warehouses. Um, there is also insurance inspection services that will be done at the warehouses access to local commodity markets. You don't just have to stay within the, vic the vicinity of the farm or where the warehouse operator is, but you can stay across the country because people are able just to buy and view the commodities from where they are and then make uh, uh, provisions for the movement of commodities after they've actually secured the, 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 the produce. 
Uh, I think I will not speak much in terms of uh, the storage mechanisms. I've spoken about that earlier, uh, as well as price discovery. I think we did that. There's also access to real-time market information because on our boards we'll be displaying uh, the last traded prices. So farmers are able to view to say how much uh, is maize going for on the exchange, uh, how much has it been traded for previously in terms of uh, one commodity or any other private commodity that would be traded on the on the platform. Then there's mobile and online convenience. Uh, they do not farmers do not need to go to the marketplace to be able to trade. You can make use of your phone. You can place your sale order on the phone. You can place your buy order on the phone from wherever you are. And you're able to make a decision to say, do you want to sell immediately or you want to wait for a week for a week, or you want to wait for a month as you would be uh, comparing prices on the platform. There are also opportunities for the business. Uh, we talk of coordinated logistics to move commodities if people have got uh, some trucks that they are looking for in terms of business operations, they can also come and partner with us. Uh, those who are into insurance inspection services, as well as, um, as, well as the banks. Uh, last on the opportunities, I think generally our country will, will benefit from increased commercialization of agricultural uh, commodities and activities as well as enhanced productivity. Uh, so we don't, we haven't done everything that we're supposed to be doing. There's still some work ahead. Uh, we need to be to be conducting comprehensive awareness and ed educational and training campaigns uh, nationwide. We have been doing quite a lot, but we can agree probably with the people in the house that uh, more has to be done in terms of uh, creating awareness. We are also yet to, 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 to mobilize enough uh, warehouse infrastructure, uh, focusing on minimum standards. Like I indicated before, we have got 26 warehouses, and there are some places that do not have warehouses uh, as we speak like for now. And we are in the process of mobilizing uh, warehouse infrastructure in those areas. We are also setting up structural transport logistics that will, will reach even to the farm level. Uh, so this is also that we are yet to do. Uh, setting up of centralized stock order facilities, as well as our onboarding of uh, the horticulture and livestock commodities that are yet to be onboarded. We are also having plans to be restructuring production contracts uh, to, able to ensure that they are standardized and bankable financial instruments that will be acceptable to invest investors as well as um, as well as to 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 grow funds. Now, this is how people will be able to contact us uh, by dialing star 727 and uh, getting the prompts to, to register. We also have people on standby on that WhatsApp number that is displayed on the screen uh, for calls as well as for WhatsApp, as well as the landline number that is indicated below. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think this is our presentation. Uh, and back to you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chiedza, for the effective Men's marketing and selling opportunities on the Zimbabwe Mercantile Exchange platform. We now move to the question and answer segment. So please continue submitting your questions and comments via the chat or comment section if you are watching us live on our Facebook page. Uh, we have a question here for ZMX. It says, um, how long does it take to get a payment and in what currency? Uh, Chiaza, if you can take that one. Uh, thank you. So I think uh, uh, you it, it got propped up a bit. How long does it take for to process the payment? Is it, is yeah, it the sure. question? Yes, All right. Yes, so, yes. so our payment is on T plus three. It means that uh, on day three you should be able to receive your your payments after after you've deposited after the trades you have made. So what I uh, what I mean is that you deposit your commodity on the warehouse and then you place your sale order and your your product is available for viewing by the buyers and if a buyer also pledges to buy that commodity at the designated price that you were asking for in the trade matches so once a trade matches we will be able to settle in T plus three uh, this also just have, have to be done what if what we have to be done uh, before the settlement is done in T plus three is that uh, the official registration so if the both the buyer and the seller are registered it will be T plus three in the events because of where we're beginning we are still starting and some people might not be fully registered uh, processing may sometimes take uh, up to day four or day five but we are aiming to to settle in three days thank you and then in terms of the currency so we are using you are using both currency it can either be usd or it can be zwl the way it operates is like this so if you are a farmer and you want to sell in zwl you will go to our zwl page and you post your sale order in zwl your sale order can only be viewed by buyers who have CWL. So your trades will match in that currency. If you are a seller, likewise, who have got um, 
uh, US dollars and you want to buy in US dollars, farmers also have to be pledging in US dollars. So the trades will just meet uh, on that on those interfaces. There is no crisscrossing to say uh, I, I, I pledged in US dollar now. Please convert it to ZWL or, or 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 vice versa. So you can trade in all currencies, the US US, US dollar or the ZWL, but we have to stick uh, to that page. If you want to 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 change from one currency, you can delete that appli that that sell order that we have um, posted on our platform and say I no longer want to sell in this currency, and then you repost in another currency. Thank you. All right, thanks so much for taking that one. And then whilst you are still there, uh, another farmer says, thanks ZMX, we need more of these informative sessions. Um, I think you had answered this one. What are the advantages of ZMX offer other buyers? I think you had covered this in your presentation, maybe they joined late. Maybe you can just quickly highlight. Okay, so now for ZMX, I think the, the biggest advantage is that uh, a farmer or a buyer is able to determine the price that they want to sell for it. So if you, 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 can, you can decide the price, you're not just going to be a price taker. You can pledge the price that you are selling it, and then the buyer can also pledge the price that they're selling it. Uh, there's also the advantage of uh, the issuance of a warehouse receipt that you can use to access collateral, so to access funds from the bank, loans from the bank, uh, using that warehouse receipt as collateral. Then we are also priding ourselves in terms of logistics. If you are unable to secure transport services, we can come and collect products from uh, a central place. I know that there's some other place that cannot be very accessible. Maybe we can make arrange arrangements to collect from a central place, uh, probably at a school or a clinic or just somewhere that is close to where you are. In, in, in the event that uh, the roads are not very accessible to the 30 ton trucks that we use. Uh, so you also be able to benefit from uh, from that. So maybe in summary, uh, that those are the advantages that you can, you can actually get. And then the, the, the payment period, you don't have to wait for forever before you receive your payments are able to pay you uh, promptly. Well, thanks, uh, Shia. So then uh, just uh, a quick uh, comment on this uh, message from Mavis. Mavis says, Thank you, ZMX. We eagerly wait for the time when horticulturists can also be engaged. Uh, thanks, Memphis, that we are working uh, flat out to ensure that horticulture is actually there. Uh, we've got a whole list of other horticulture products that do not really need uh, a lot of cold chain facilities. And we have started with a pilot uh, just to see how the modalities will come to, to be like before we go fully fledged. So we are sure by the end of, uh, of the year, we'll have horticulture trading seamlessly. We are still learning from the pilot that we are implementing uh, so far, but this will be uh, very soon. Thanks so much. Uh, then uh, uh, this one is for Mr. Mkandla. It says, thanks, Mr. Mkandla, for the great presentation. I saw malathion on the list of ingredients. Does it mean I can use malathion that I already have in order to save on other coins? Yes, uh, for grain storage, can you hear me? For yes. grain storage, yes. is the formulation is the formulation. It's not just if you saw malathion as an active ingredient, there's malathion 25 WP, malathion 50 EC. Those are too strong. They are too strong formulations. Those are normally used for spraying. You mix them with water, you dilute them down, and then you spray your, your whatever you want to spray. But the grain dust, they are already diluted for you. So they are ready to use. So the malathion, as long as it's a 1% dust, a 1% test. I think that's the one that you can you can use. I don't know if you can get it, but uh, malathion is not that uh, great as a grain protectant. It's 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 not as as effective as the newer ones. But if you have it as a test, you can use it. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mkandla, for that one. Then how long can maize be consumed after applying uh, grain protectants? And how often can I check on my stored grain? I think you covered this in your presentation, maybe just a bit. Uh, yes, it, it, it varies. It's product by product. Uh, it's as short as seven days after application, and it's as long as 30 days. So you need to check on that particular label. Uh, what it says. There's no like one one size fits all. They are, they are all different. And checking grains, uh, I would say every yeah every two months would be safe enough just to check if 
insects are coming in if you need to do a retreatment. But some of the better grain protectants, you treat once and for 12 months, they'll be protected. But you need to just keep going in and, and checking what's happening. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mkandla, for taking that one. Then this one is from uh, Adoma Farms. They say, is there a regulation that stops farmers from selling maize before expired date of grain protectants? Or it is up to the farmer's conscience? And what can be done to protect the consumers in your view, Mr. Mkandla? Farmers selling grain. Okay, let's say it's a 30-day waiting period. I mean, as a, as a producer, you need to be a responsible person to your, to your consumers. It's just like your, your vegetables. There are some, there are some uh, sprays for aphids and all. It's got a 14-day waiting period. If you as a farmer sprayed yesterday and then you harvest that, the rape, which has been treated with that, I'll not mention the name, with that particular, you are like an irresponsible uh, uh, grower to your to your market, because the consumers are your market, and uh, and and consumers now they know they can even smell. Sometimes they can even smell that chemical in your in your crop. So it's it's unfair to uh, to put on the market product which is supposed to be in the waiting period. We call it it's called the PHI pre harvest interval. It really should be post harvest interval. Is it seven days? Is it is it uh, 30 days check on the on the label so farmers please note that uh, yes we may need uh, money or quick money but it is important to ensure the safety of our uh, consumers uh, another one says thanks for this webinar can the same protectants be used in other crops such as groundnuts Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you mean harvested groundnuts. It, they can be used on grains, on, on any harvested grain. By grain, we mean soya beans, wheat, rice, uh, nyemba, nyemo, nzungu, yeah, your groundnuts, uh, everything can be used. Because they, they, do, they do get, after shelling them, they do get, uh, they can get attacked by these insect pests. Yes, and the same, waiting period will apply. The same rate of usage, so many grams per 50 kg applies, whether it's maize or groundnuts or whatever. Very important as well to uh, protect the seed because some farmers want to, like your groundnuts, you, you don't have to buy seed all the time. So what you put aside a seed, you need to protect it. Because if it, if it, normally these insects, they go for the embryo, which is that germination point. They don't eat the rest of the uh, of the grain or of the seed. They just eat the embryo. The, the seed looks okay, but you plant it, it doesn't germinate because there's no embryo anymore. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Mkandla. Then we are an association of farmers here in Marsh East. We have seen an influx of fake grain protectants on the market. What's your advice to us farmers, Mr. Mkandla, and where can we get actelic gold? Uh, influx is a, is because of competition, which is which is allowed, which is healthy, which <laughs> keeps prices of, of these uh, products low. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it, it means people are, are active. But just watch out for fake products. That's the one. Even a telecall dust has been faked two years ago. There was some fake product in Mutare. We had to follow it with the with the government uh, registrar, minister of. Uh, and they managed to identify that it's really fake product. And if it's fake product, you don't know what is in that bottle. It could be something which is really, really poisonous. It could be DDT. It could, you don't want to be putting DDT in your, uh, in your food. So go to the genuine uh, retailers. Your, uh, I don't want to advertise shops. It's places like Farm and City, your, your farm shops, your farm bees, your N. Richards, your Metro Peach, your OK. Uh, TMs, uh, TM pick and pay, th those kinds of outlets. And there are also agro dealers, hardware shops, agro dealers, veterinary distributors. There are so many of them. Uh, avoid buying uh, from the street. When you buy from a, a shop, just look at the container and, 
And you can judge if the label looks a bit suspicious. If it's a photocopy type of label, don't touch it. It, it should look like a genuine label. So for specific products, like you said, Actelli Gold Dust is those, those outlets which I mentioned, uh, they do stock and they'll stock other, other uh, grain protectants as well. Yeah, so really you need to watch out for fake products. So uh, for emphasizing on that one, Mr. Mr. Mukandla, then the last one I will take is for ZMX, uh, or maybe before that one, we're asking for your contacts. How can we contact you, Mr. Mukandla? Can I type on the chat? Yeah, sure, please do. Uh, okay. Then uh, the last one I'll take is from uh, Pela. Pela says, thank you for the presentation, ZMX. Any plans to introduce poetry, especially road runners, in the future? Thank you, Pilaja. Yes, like I indicated, uh, what it, when when we move uh, into into livestock, and livestock is probably going to be earlier, uh, much much earlier than uh, than horticulture, probably by the first of um, of September. So yes, we have uh, poultry. We have got our cattle, our sheep, our goats. We will have poultry, like we indicated. Maybe what is best is for you, Pilaja, to keep in touch with us so that as soon as we have this rolling out, you'll probably be one of the of the first people to know about it and one of the first people to, to participate. And even as we move into the pilot stage, just to see uh, the modalities on how this will be operating, we could also make you so far few and, uh, and if you've got access to, to such livestock uh, for the pilot. Thank you. All right, thanks for taking that one uh, here. So this marks the end of uh, our webinar, and we do hope that today's discussion has equipped you farmers with valuable insights and guidance for a thriving maize production uh, business. And as a reminder, we do have a community of farmers and experts in our WhatsApp groups, and we do have over 300 uh, WhatsApp groups that you can take advantage of. So we do have sent a link uh, in the chat. Please uh, take advantage of that and join one of the groups where you can further engage with these uh, experts and uh, fellow farmers. We do encourage you to join this network of like-minded individuals to continue learning and sharing your experience. We extend our gratitude to our presenters and the respective organizations uh, they represent. Uh, Isa Jaidi from the Department of Agriculture and uh, Rural Development Advisory Services, which is under the Ministry of Agriculture. We also had Mr. John Kandla, a seasoned agronomist uh, from Syngenta. And we had Chiedza Sangweme from the Zimbabwe Mercantile Exchange. Your participation and engagement uh, has been crucial to, uh, in making this event a tremendous uh, success. So thank you so much, farmers, for participating, for joining in, for tuning in, and for your time and attention. We do look forward to hosting you on our next webinar. And remember, these webinars are weekly, so please do not miss the upcoming ones. Until then, we wish you the best and have a great day. And uh, wish you the best in your maize production and give us have a fantastic day, farmers. Thank you.